हाय एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू माय यूट्यूब चैनल डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास मेडिकल कॉन्सेप्ट्स एंड माय एवी पेज डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास कॉन्सेप्ट्स दिस इज डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट फ्रॉम आंध्र प्रदेश इंडिया आई एम आल्सो द मेडिकल ऑथर ऑफ द बुक फोकस्ड न्यूरोलॉजी टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट अ वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक द कैटेगरीज ऑफ न्यूरोलॉजिकल डिजीजेस द एटियोलॉजी मेड इजी we have so many categories of neurological disorders when a person suffers from a neurological disorder there are so many categories so how to remember all these categories of neurological disorders so that we can efficiently make a diagnosis there are so many categories but to remember all the categories may be difficult so we have a very interesting and good mnemonic vitamin d v i t a m i n d vitamin d if we remember this mnemonic vitamin d we can almost remember all the categories of neurological disorders so let's now see the mnemonic vitamin d which is the etiology for almost all the categories of neurological disorders the v stands for vascular so any person especially an older person a senior citizen presents with sudden onset of deficit a sudden onset of deficit we think it as a vascular cause v stroke cerebrovascular accident so they may be having the associated atherosclerotic risk factors like hypertension diabetes hyperlipidemia smoking and alcoholism so vascular is one of the most important categories of neurological disorders especially in senior citizens if they present with sudden onset of focal neurological deficit we have to think of a vascular cause the stroke that is v next comes the letter i i stands for infection i stands for also inflammation and immunological infection if a person presents in a sub acute manner with headache fever neck stiffness altered sensorium we have to think of an infectious cause meningoencephalitis if it is associated with seizures and altered behavior encephalitis brain is also involved if there's only head fever and neck stiffness we think of meningitis usually they occur together then we call that as meningoencephalitis so the second most important category is eye infections the others being the inflammatory disorders and immunological disorders so we have seen v i the next is t t is for trauma most often there would be history of trauma forthcoming but sometimes due to reasons best known to the patient or the patient's attendants they may hide the reason of trauma so we have to evaluate we need to get a ct scan done check out on whether there is any hematoma on the imaging clinically we look at the pupillary size look at the asterisks if there is an asterisks it is more in favor of metabolic abnormality if there is pupillary abnormality it is traumatic so whenever a person comes in an unconscious state which with a dubious history of or a or a doubtful history of trauma we should always look out on the pupillary size if there is an asymmetry of pupil anisocoria the hematoma is going compressing the midbrain third now the parasympathetic fibers get compressed so one side the pupil is dilated the other side pupil is normal and then he is in for trouble and therefore we have to take an emergent ct scan which may reveal extra dural hematoma extra dural hematoma is the hematoma which lies outside the dura so it is well localized because the dura is a tough membrane it will not allow the blood to to slip or to seep and it is usually because of an arterial rupture middle meningeal arterial rupture and therefore we have to take emergent measures call neurosurgeon and take the hematoma out interestingly they may present with lucid interval because of the trauma there is momentary concussion and person loses consciousness but soon he will regain consciousness but then the hematoma the blood vessel rupture the blood starts leaking and it starts expanding so much so that it goes and compress the ras 
system, reticular activating system or the arousal and activating system and therefore the person loses consciousness again. So initially at the time of trauma he loses consciousness but then again he regains consciousness only to lose consciousness again because of the expansion of the hematoma going compressing the arousal system, reticular activating system. So this is known as lucid interval. If that kind of history is forthcoming, then it is extra dural hematoma. Sometimes trauma can produce subdural hematoma where there is a venous leak and the blood starts leaking under the dura and therefore it extends from the frontal even till the occipital lobe and it is one of the treatable cause of dementia. So any old person comes with history of injury or even without of history of injury because even a trivial injury can rupture the vein and cause hematoma. So if there is a dementia and then if there is subdural hematoma, the moment we take the hematoma out, person's uh, memory comes back. It's a treatable cause of dementia, chronic subdural hematoma. So VIT, now let's see the A. A is for alcoholism and other toxins. Alcoholism, there's a history of alcoholism. When there's a history of alcoholism, usually there will be cerebellar involvement. So alcohol is, alcohol is a toxin to cerebellum. Especially the vermis gets affected, they will have gait impairment, they will have truncal ataxia. Usually flocculonodular node is spared or, or the vestibular cerebellum is spared, so they may not have much of eye findings, but they will have severe gait ataxia, cerebellum is involved. They will have neuropathy also, so alcoholic neuropathy and then they can have vitamin B1 deficiency, thiamine deficiency, they can present with vernic korsakoff psychosis. The characteristic finding of Korsakoff psychosis is confabulation. When they are asked to tell what's ha what has happened, they would tell it. But then they will have lapses of memory. But then they would not agree that they have lapses of memory. They try to fill up the lapses of memory with false stories. What we call it as confabulation. Confabulation is very characteristic of Korsakoff psychosis. So we have seen VITA. Next is metabolic. Metabolic could be either inherited or acquired. Inherited, uh, the grey matter can get affected or the white matter can get affected. If the grey matter gets affected, we have clinical findings suggest of grey matter disorder like memory impairment and seizures. If white matter are, is affected, leukodystrophy, the pathways gets affected, the tracts gets affected, the cerebellum, optic nerve, posterior column or pyramidal tract. In acquired form, the metabolic disorder we see is the common uh, disorder we see is vitamin B12 uh, deficiency. So V I T A M. Next comes I. I lot of inborn, especially in children, there may be a lot of inborn errors of metabolism, uh, congenital and genetic causes. So in a child, especially we have to think of inborn errors of metabolism, which uh, which causes the neurological impairment. Usually they present uh, in the form of seizures. N. N is for nutritional as well as neoplasia. Nutritional, it could be B1 deficiency as we just discussed, Wernicke-Korsakoff psychosis. It could be B6 deficiency or B12 impairment causing subacute combined degeneration where in the posterior column, permal tract and the peripheral nerves get affected. It could be neoplastic. Neoplastic again, it could be of two types when it affects the brain. Either it is a direct metastasis to the brain. In fact, the commonest cause of brain tumor is not the primary tumor but metastasis, especially the lung cancer. So when there is neoplasia, it could be a metastasis or paraneoplastic neurological syndrome, wherein the antibodies are produced and go and destroy the brain, especially the cerebellum. We see this in common in lung cancer. So neoplasia can be because of direct metastasis and affecting the brain or paraneoplastic neurological syndrome affecting the brain. And finally, we have D, the demyelination and degenerative. Demyelination again could be central and the central myelination is caused by oligodendrocyte. So if that gets affected, there is a central demyelination. The classic disorder is multiple sclerosis where the central part, central nervous system gets affected. The optic nerve gets affected because optic nerve is an extension of central nervous system. It is not peripheral nervous system. So in central nervous system demyelinating disorder like multiple sclerosis, optic nerve gets affected because it is a part of central nervous system. They have cerebellar involvement, they have permal tract involvement, posterior column involvement. But spinothalamic generally is not affected because spinothalamic tract is least myelinated. 
and we have the acquired from the Gulenberry syndrome and acquired demyelinating neuropathy. A uh, very in interesting and important distinguishing feature between the demyelinating neuropathy and axonal neuropathy is that demyelinating neuropathy is length independent. Both the proximal and distal parts almost get equally affected. So they'll have a global loss of uh, deep tendon reflexes, global weakness. Unlike axonal neuropathy like diopters where they have uh, distal parts getting more affected than the proximal parts because it's a length dependent neuropathy. Whereas a demyelinative neuropathy is a length independent neuropathy. The classic example is Gulenberry syndrome where there's global involvement of deep tendon reflexes and global involvement of weakness. So almost all the categories of neurological disorders, all the disorders which affect the nervous system will fit into one of these major groups. So if we remember the acronym Vitamin D, V-I-T-A-M-I-N-D, we can almost remember all the different categories of diseases which affect the nervous system. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments, kindly post on to my YouTube channel. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Sinos Medical Concepts, and my every page, Dr. Sinos Concepts. Thank you. Bye.